And I want a, a special thanks to, to all of our, our special guests that have joined for this, this journal club. Um, <clears throat> so just as a very short preamble, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine and the, and the team to go through it. Uh, the NSEP guide is a document that's produced annually um, that provides what I believe is globally probably the best, most up-to-date resource for pharmacoepidemiologic best practices. Uh, and while it is driven out of our colleagues in Europe um, with support from the EMA, I think it's highly relevant to the entire world and highly relevant to anybody who's analyzing observational data, not just those that are doing pharmacoepidemiology and pharmacovigilance. Um, and I've noticed in, in, in passing conversations with folks outside of Europe that the visibility of the NSEP guide isn't nearly as much as it should be, uh, and people are still pointing to antiquated textbooks and other things, whereas what Catherine and the team have done here is created a really amazing resource because they keep it up to date with kind of up to date with the latest literature and, and, and other current uh, evolutions in the conversations that are going on about real world evidence, best practices. And so I was glad that we could have this journal club and really thankful to um, all of the uh, participants here who have put a lot of effort into preparing this resource. I know I asked of the Holy Community to please read this ahead of time. So I'm really looking forward to having the, the team share their insights about the process of creating this and their lessons learned and key insights that they want you all to know. But I'm really hoping that we can have a thoughtful discussion and get a good Q&A going about other thoughts that the community has as you've read this document as a reference to think about both what can we learn and what should we bring into the Odyssey community, but also what are the gaps that this document identifies of which it does a really good job of pointing to where there's future research and how we in the Odyssey community could help to uh, contribute to future mm -hmm future iterations of this. Um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Catherine. And Catherine, I really appreciate you joining us uh, and uh, for all the work you do to, to be the editor of this document, but also for agreeing to come to our community and share your own perspective about this document and provide some guidance to the community about how we can take advantage of this tremendous resource. Thank you, Patrick. That's a really lovely introduction. And uh, you know, I'm very pleased to be here. And I I mean, it's not only me. Um, I really want to say thank you also on behalf of the NSEP Working Group 1. So that's the Working Group on Standard and Guidance. And this is the group of people who every year convene uh, to decide on the structure, to decide on the improvements required, etc. So uh, I hope everybody read the entire guide before this meeting or not. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to, to to pick on a few comments that you made and uh, um, it, it, it's about the recognition and the transparency so the, I think it's really nice also uh, for, for this group uh, who has a lot of uh, you know your PhD students postdocs etc and it's nice also that recently I've seen some some contribution so there are all the long-standing authors who have been there since the beginning and who sometimes think oh yeah maybe we don't need to you know we don't need to change anything confounding is confounding uh, we we know that so um, it, it, it's nice to see the diversity of, of of authors. It's been also evolving. So it's the 11th edition now, um, and I've been the editor for three years. And it's nice to see now that we are moving away a little bit from COVID. So there was a lot of, you know, trying to um, trying to take av advantage of all the learnings from from the, the COVID, and it also it also turned into some challenges because I'm I'm in charge uh, myself of the vaccine chapter, and it's it's getting like almost a textbook on on vaccines. So we are, I, I also would be really interested to hear from everybody what you think of the structure because it's a bit of an unusual structure building on reference references uh, of the literature uh, a bit challenging because every year we are wondering should we drop the old 1985 reference which was a foundational reference etc etc so any criticism any suggestion for improvement would be really really appreciated and um, yeah I don't want to speak too much because I, I really want to, to take questions and, and let the, the few authors who are here today um, uh, present their own chapters um, but yeah, any any comment on the structure? And if you read only one thing, maybe have a look at the foreword, uh, which uh, highlights a little bit the changes uh, every year. So this year, for instance, focusing a bit more on target trial emulation and comparative effectiveness research, 
a couple of new chapters in the past two years or so on um, putting in context with real world evidence, pharmacopian real world evidence, um, more stuff on pharmacogenomics, um, a new annex on pregnancy, etc. So I should probably stop here. Uh, I'm going to stay if there are any questions and I, I, I hand back to you, uh, Patrick. And, and thanks again so much for the for the interest. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. So, uh, Craig, I'm going to let you moderate because we've got a bunch of folks that we can let go through the chapters, but maybe just as a point of action for logistics, maybe if folks want to post questions in the chat, we'll we'll moderate that at the end after everybody's gone through. And also, if folks have burning questions they want to raise, they can also just raise their hand in the Teams meeting. All right. Thank you, Patrick. All right. We, we just, I kind of just listed people in alphabetical order. So, uh, Sintong, do you want to start and talk a little bit about your chapter? Of course, uh, hope the voice is fine. Yeah. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Yeah, I don't have a slide, um, but I'll try to make it quick. So, so I was in, uh, involved in editing of these two sections, as is passing next control and also um, at, like active comparators. I'll just go through them quickly. Um, but for today, make sure it's very quickly. So yeah, so before starting this, I did a quick check on PubMed searching like next sequential, post sequential, and also requiring to be observational or real world data study. And this is the number we have here. So it's 400 ish in total, according to like decades. So it's um, actually not that a popular method comparing to other um, epidemiological methods we can use, but I think, um, Okay. Yeah. So for here, um, this this uh, section on positive and active controls, I think um, we first listed some like existing literatures on ex to expand this methods and also um, the key points to be taken into consideration. So for example, um, how to choose a proper annex for control outcomes and how can you use them for further calibration. Um, but in the end, we didn't give like too much or um, like detailed instructions or, how, or uh, suggestions basically, because this method is kind of still um, undeveloped. And well, on the versus side, just for the uh, like active, active uh, comparator, which I will talk about later, we gave more uh, like direct suggestions. And also uh, in this part, this this one, um, there's uh, there's a, like a seminar from Duke uh, earlier this year. I found this very useful. So the link is available here under this section. And if you click, you get the uh, like there's the FBA F sponsored talk. And I think Patrick and also <laughs> Mark uh, was involved in that one. They did a very well summary of the use of Nazi controls. Um, then if you were interested, you can watch, they have like a four hours video and I myself when doing this editing um, this year, I found this one is really useful. So this is the native control and policy. And the second one is the active comparators. And basically we, this year we removed some of the um, like reference that we have before and we're trying to make sure points that um, it suggests to use active comparators, but also if you can't find the proper one, maybe consider other methods that's been listed here uh, in this guidance. So I think that's a brief um, go through of this section that I was involved in, and we'll pass to the next person. Thank you. Great, Sun Tong. Thank you so much. Sun Tong was a Titan Award winner last year, so congratulations. And uh, and we will have a new batch of winners at the symposium this year. OK, uh, next up, Kim. Kim Lopez, well, I see you there. I'm not sure if you're. Hi, can you hear yeah. me? I can hear you now, yes. Um, let me share my screen as well. Um, so um, Albert and me, both of us, um, were charged with doing the interrupted time series and difference and differences part. Um, the first part was actually already written down, so the RTS part was already there. It's not, it wasn't us who, who wrote it. Um, we added the difference in differences. I'm going to talk about this in a second. 
Um, and Kim, are you trying to share slides? Because they're not up yet. Oh, you're not, you're not, you are not you do not see my, my no, slide. Not yet. Do, do you want me to share the? OK, yeah, okay. Can, you, can you share it? Can you see it? Yeah, I can see your screen now. Um, so the first couple of, of paragraphs on ITS, which is interrupted time series analysis, um, which is basically models that um, try to um, understand data that has a particular point in time where there is like an interve intervention and then you try to compare pre and post intervention data. Um, that was already written down when Albert and I stepped in. And then we added the different and differences paragraphs afterwards, which uh, is a particular model that also takes into account data from a control group so that um, you essentially try to take out any effects from exogenous variables and you end up just um, calculating the, the estimate for the actual intervention itself in the treatment group. Um, and this year we we changed some of the references um, in the end to try and update them. These differences and differences analysis is a model usually used in econometrics, so a little bit not not as common in public health, but it's 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 being picked up way more lately. Um, I don't know if either you want to add anything, or I'm not sure to what extent people want to hear about the model itself. Um, yeah, no, I think you explain. Uh super well what we did we basically added the we were working at the time in a paper on the impact of um, non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, using a different in different model so we were asked to add uh, this kind of different in difference and we added like basically a bibliography on on how to do this um, in a relatively simple different difference model uh, there's a lot more complex things but uh, we went for for the simple more simple stuff that we think it's quite useful also for for um for to check interventions and, and evaluate intervention so yeah that's it i think great uh thank you kim and Albert, uh, we are the next up person I have is Daniel Morales, but I don't see him on the on the list of, of attendees. Daniel, are you there? OK, uh, let's move forward. If I see him pop up, I'll Graham, go back. Can, can you hear me? OK. Oh, yeah. Hey, well, Daniel. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to. Uh, touch base and tell you a little bit on uh, one of the chapters on systematic review and meta-analysis. Now, this is really just an example of how we have maybe approached the integration of information within the guide um, and how it's maybe evolved over time. So I'm not going to start from the beginning of what a systematic review is, um, but obviously traditionally it came about as that the the, the area for sort of summary estimates from trials. But obviously a number of years ago, we start to see uh, meta-analyses of observational studies uh, becoming much more frequent. And we'd recognize that there was a gap there, especially from a, a non-interventional study area. So that led to the first sort of evolution of this in the guide. Now, obviously over the years, things have moved on in, in, the, in the area of sort of meta-analysis. Um, we now have the ability to do network meta-analyses individual patient data meta-analyses and actually as you're all familiar with with the community it's the network federated uh, uh, analysis which quite often end up in a meta-analysis and all of these although we may have a, a common sort of approach that might be a random effects model at the end there are many different things and aspects uh, that we need to consider along the way um, uh, that are common to many non-interventional studies so to give you an idea of some of the updates from this year, really just to, to choose it, the, um, we, we added a section on prospective and federated meta-analysis. Um, again, often we don't want to necessarily just create uh, a, a, the most comprehensive encyclopedia or textbook of this. We want to really focus on the key elements and where we can 
uh, reference other sources that people can go to. Um, we also um, featured more information on uh, the approach to individual patient data meta-analysis, um, uh, particularly in, in the area of data quality as well with regard to that. And obviously the EMA data quality and data quality frameworks are becoming, you know, uh, very, very uh, uh, sort of in the, in the everyone's uh, mind in that perspective. Um, and then um, we also um, added a little bit more, uh, I think, on network meta-analysis, for example. But I would just encourage you to have a read. And um, I think the, the really nice thing is as well, we often don't have one author that stays for 30 years doing a, a review in a chapter. You'll probably see over time a slight change as we get fresh experience, new experience, new skills coming in. So, you know, we're always on the lookout for, for these sorts of interactions. Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have Nicholas Snorin. Yes, thank you. Uh, so let me see if I can share my screen here. Just give me a second. You now see the uh, chapter overview? Yes. Very good. All right, so I will talk about uh, two chapters that I've been involved in for, for some years, uh, probably around 2015 or 2017, around that time. Um, and the first one is spontaneous report. So you find this under the general chapter of approaches to data collection. So there, the ENSOP guide covers primary data collection, secondary use of data, patient registries, and then spontaneous reports. And this is the subsection where I've been involved. So many of you may not be uh, often working with spontaneous reports, may not be too interested, but I think it, it's still relevant. Um, if you endeavor to do some work in that area, or even just as a backdrop, if you do any work that's related to the pharmacovigilance use case, where maybe you're looking at the way uh, routinely collected health data can play a role in that context, I think it's useful to look at this uh, subsection because it spells out some of the strengths and weaknesses of uh, the individual case reports that those containers reports that are, I think, still the most important source of information that inform regulatory decisions when it comes to safety signals detected in the post-marketing setting. So uh, we will not drill too deeply into this, but it will start, and I think it's worth noting, it is like I think Catherine said at the start and maybe Patrick in his introduction, this is a European document, so it comes at it from a European perspective. And if you look at this introduction, we do not call all the different um, sources of uh, individual case reports or, you know, globally. We don't mention uh, JADER or, or uh, you know, some of the other major uh, data sets that are available out there. We start from Eurovigilance, which is the European data set. We do branch out and mention FAERS and VAERS, which are the biggest uh, national data sets in both from the US and then uh, Vigibase, which is the WHO global database of individual case reports. Uh, but then we go into actually uh, describing some of the strengths uh, of the uh, individual case reports. And so one is scope, of course. We we cover all types of authorized medicines and also uh, herbal products, etc. It's both primary and secondary care. It's also over-the-counter medicines. Uh, so it, it's really broad if you compare to other data sources. Um, and then this other aspect that's sort of built into the whole um, system of uh, spontaneous reporting, which is it is primary data collection for the purpose of pharmacovigilance. So we're capturing information, often not perfectly, I mean, clearly. I mean, there's often a lot of missing information and the average uh, individual case report may not be that useful. But if you have a really well documented report, you actually have somebody collecting information for the purpose of supporting a causality assessment in that individual case. And this is, I think, a real strength of the individual case reports and, and something that's that we're not seeing if, if we're working with data collected for other purposes, such as an electronic medical records or, or you know, an insurance claims data, etc. And maybe in the future, this is my hope, is that we'll build in some of these, uh, some of these data collection into the other data sources, so we'll have the strengths of, of both systems. But the guide here go, goes into a little bit more details and, and uh, points to some publications that uh, describe some of these strengths, and then goes from there to the limitations, because there are many limitations uh, with uh, these data when you work with them, both in terms of what you can do with a clinical review, but also, of course, with uh, any statistical methods that you apply. 
So there's um, a section describing some of these limitations. Some of them come back in the other chapter that I'm going to talk about, which is the signal detection uh, chapter, because we, then, then we talk about those limitations from the perspective of applying a signal detection methodology. Uh, but they're, they're also described here. Uh, and then I think we also go into some, some detail into uh, just, just some of the issues. So we have some of the specific quality issues like case report duplication uh, and some of the attempts to, to, to remedy that. Uh, and then also describe some of the variability in terms of who's actually providing the report. So if it's a patient providing a, a report of their own experience versus if it's a health professional, uh, a pharmacist or a doctor uh, writing a report on, you know, an event in, in another person. Uh, I think it is also worth noting what it says at the stop, or sorry, at the top of this uh, subsection, which is we actually did not make any updates in revision 11. So this is exactly the same text as we had in uh, revision 10 uh, because there had not been uh, significant enough updates. And I think this has certainly been the experience with my work here is that um, it's it's a bit uneven. So some years like this, in this this case it was extreme, we made no updates. Other years we may make more minor updates. And at some points there are, there are some bigger efforts to really overhaul uh, content. And sometimes, like I think Daniel said before, this could be driven by when a new person comes on board and looks at it with fresh eyes, or there's just been enough um, development in the area that it motivates a, a bigger effort at that point. Uh, so if, if I conclude that part uh, related to that specific source of data, and then we, we just drill down and we look here, we see uh, there's a whole set chapter on signal detection methodology. This is largely focused on signal detection methodology for individual case reports. So most will be uh, on that, uh, for, for that data, uh, because it is the one data set that's still mostly used for signal detection uh, in, in routine use. Uh, and so if we open one of these uh, sections and we go into methods of statistical signal detection, we see this will call out some of the sort of general references that are used, uh, like the review paper from PDS um, by Bate and Evans in, in 2009 um, and, and some of the other ones. But I think like Patrick said in his initial introduction, I mean, one of the strengths of the ANSEP document is uh, that it's actually being updated. So the problem with that old, uh, old well, I guess it's old, it's 14 years old now. It's a, that paper from 2009 it's of course it's 14 years old so it may have been state of the art in terms of capturing everything we knew at, at the time but of course the community has moved on and that i think is part of the strength um with the ANSEP guide and I, and I would agree i think it's probably underused and i think we we underuse it even in my organization where we have new people coming on board so i think uh, it can be a really useful reference um this section goes into some detail in, in describing some of the most standard methods like disproportionality analysis and then some of the improved methods that have been proposed, like uh, the use of multiple logistic regression in particular to handle confound by co-medications. It looks at some of the more uh, the newer methods that do more comprehensive uh, screening methods that look not just at uh, basically the counts of reports, but also try to look at the maybe the quality and content of, of different reports, time to the patterns, etc. Um, and I think that that's what I will say uh, for that one. I think it is worth noting in um, uh, in this section, there, there is a section on performance comparison of, of different methods. And I think this one is one that's useful. Um, some of the thinking that's in these papers, I think, is also useful if you want to do performance comparison of signal detection methods also in observational data. And you'll find that even one of the um, one of the specific examples here, it was a study of, of uh, methods in the FDA Atlas event reporting system, but it actually used uh, a benchmark. Uh, it says here, the benchmark constructed by Odyssey. I don't know if that's true, if it's coming from OMO, but I think it, it's one of the Patrick will know for sure, but it's one of the resources that was developed either either by Odyssey or by, by OMOP as its uh, predecessor. Uh, I will also quickly, and then I'll uh, conclude, just look at this section 11.7, because this is a data set that goes into very limited, but some 
uh, discussion around other data sources. So see, the very first paragraph here is, is more about how do you find out what's already known in terms of what's in the scientific literature. But I think this this has connections with the Odyssey work. Uh, I, think, I think it may have changed, but this evidence synthesis work stream of trying to bring together uh, what we already know. And this, I think, would be hugely valuable for the pharmacovigilance community because we spend a lot of time actually determining if we see something that looks suspicious, is this something we're already aware about uh, or not? But then the second paragraph is is now opening the question uh, and saying, okay, other uh, routinely collected health data or observational databases uh, can play a role here, could play a role, uh, we still believe. Um, and then just points to some of the work, and you'll see that Odyssey is, is also called out as one of those um, broader collaborations where we still do a lot of work on this topic. Um, and then some of the papers that have been published. The papers we refer to here are the papers that actually don't just look at the routinely collected health data, but actually look at the combination of that with, say, the individual case reports and or search logs or social media or some other data source. Uh, I think there's room for extension here. So maybe this is an area uh, where we should be writing more because there has been a lot of research. There's been several recent uh, reviews, one scope review and one, I think, systematic review published on on the research that's been done on the topic. So probably th this is something maybe to be considering for uh, for the next revision. And with that, I will uh, I will conclude my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Luis Pinero. Uh, I have. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, perfect. I have got some feedback in, in the, the audio. Sorry. OK, I have a very short slide deck. Um, just bring it up. We can see that. OK, and I jumped that and um, yeah, so Nicholas has, has talked about the signal detection methodology. I was, I was one of the authors as well. Shout out to some past authors that might be in the call. So Jim Arikandori was a, was a past author. He was not reflected in the most recent iteration of this, but uh, shout out to him. And um, yeah, just a little note that Otzi was name checked twice. I think that's <laughs> that's really positive. Uh, I think I might have introduced one of those. So um, I duplicate I, I increased by by 100 your your shout outs um so I'll, I'll focus on the ai and pharmacopoeiology so this this is um um sort of a recent addition and it was xavier kurs our, our uh, previous uh, line manager at the agency that um, suggested that uh, we tackle this topic and uh first he asked whether we we should do it and i thought okay well we we can do something but a sort of opinionated introduction to ai and, and pharmacopoeiology so not not the ultimate introduction and there's a lot out there that's sort of uh, popping up in terms of how people see AI um, and its impact in pharmacopoeiology. One one of those is um, uh, Wang et al. paper, which uh, some of you were co-authors in, and there's sort of a, a just sort of a split that was made in terms of use cases, and it was mostly sort of phenotyping, signal, uh, inference, and and forecasting. Now we didn't do it in that way. We sort of do, did two clumps, which is data extraction and insights into data, and that's mostly a reflection of how we're tackling it internally. So a lot of the data extraction stuff, you can think of, of that sort of as as process, and the insights into data is healthcare analytics, and and for us internally, we sort of split it that way, so we reflected that in in the uh, in the paper. That being said, we included those topics in the um, document, and we reflect on some of those, and we flag several. Odyssey community papers and work. So, for instance, we have uh, fee evaluator mentioned as well. Uh, we then go very briefly on explainable AI, and that touches upon ethics. Um, but because the topic is discussed in greater length in chapter 15, we don't go into sort of wide discussions on it. We also have published the paper specifically on explainable AI and pharmacovigilance. Uh, it's one view. Um, obviously, these things are, are kind of elaborate and, and sort of require a lot of understanding of the actual use case. It's not a one size fit all thing. So so it, it's, it, it is obviously sort of generic in the way that it's presented. Now, the uh, this year's revision only had minor tweaks. We didn't do a lot of changes, which is some some tweaks. 
Um, but obviously, as as we all know and felt, uh, and I'm sure everyone in the call have have um, have used it, has used it in one way or the other. Uh, large language models have brought significant changes, potentially tectonic changes. But we decided not to touch on it because the impact is not entirely clear. We don't have sort of an assessment methodology. We don't. We, we're starting now a pilot to to type to try to understand how to use large language models across the agency. So it, we thought it was difficult not to end up in sort of one of the two extremes, which is either a hype or, or excessive concern, uh, or then we'd just be kind of very vague and almost like uh, just picking the box and saying, well, we recognize that ChatGPT has come out and maybe Google's gonna do something better or whatever. So we didn't touch it intentionally. And um, I would only add that next year there will likely be a big revision because we have an AI reflection paper out. Uh, so those of you that, that are not aware, the um, European Medicines uh, Regulatory Network has published an AI reflection paper. It touches upon a number of things, but it also has uh, sort of elements of, of real world data, real world evidence uh, generation using AI. And we will have an AI workshop in 2021 of November and for those that that those registrations are also open if you if you'd like to attend. So thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, another former Titan Award winner in our community, uh, Danny Prieto Alhambra. Thank you, Greg. Let me uh, share my PDF. Well, delighted to be here today. Uh, as you know, I'm meeting most of these meetings nowadays due to other uh, commitments. Um, yeah, this is a probably the least interesting of the topics for the ODC community because it's about multi-database studies. Um, I guess the main thing I'll say is there are people out there that do not do multi-database studies, believe it or not. Um, this chapter is interesting um, because it contains a lot of information on how these studies with multiple databases um, should be conducted and it gives a number of different solutions. I didn't write the first uh, version of this. I was asked to contribute in the latest um, iteration and this has been uh, driven by, by other colleagues uh, that you will see in the list of authors. Um, in any case, I'll just highlight a few things that I think are nice and relevant uh, for the ODC community. One of them is, of course, the mentioning of, um, of the use of a common data model to run multi-database studies with some nice examples of studies where um, many of you were involved, uh, including the now famous uh, uh, paper in the BMJ characterized in the background rates of adverse events of special interest and uh, that kept us quite busy <laughs> in the beginning of 2021. Um, but also other studies uh, where you have been involved, some of you have been involved in different uh, uh, parts of, uh, you know, phenotyping uh, thrombosis, phenotyping thrombosis with thrombocytopenia and and the likes before, which was of course uh, the kind of, you know, very basics because before we could really do any analytics uh, of, of that data. Um, if we then go down and scroll uh, a little bit farther, you will see a very specific mention of the OMOP CDM and uh, some of the uh, nice policy tools like DQD and uh, the mention to the CAN uh, um, um, model for quality or framework, sorry, harmonized framework for data quality assessment, all very much inspired by the OEC community. And then, um, there are uh, also a uh, some very nice mentions again to the OMOPCDM in the context, of course, of the recently set up uh, Darwin EU um, initiative, which at some point we will stop calling recently set up because it's been a year and a half already. <laughs> um, then there is, uh, the, I think, the most relevant section for those of you who have uh, not had the opportunity or the experience of working with different ways of uh, analyzing uh, multiple databases. Um, you will read the section 9.2 where we talk about different ways one could potentially tackle this problem. I by no means want people to go back to the old ways of doing things. Um, I strongly believe that uh, using a common data model and, and standardized uh, analytics are the way forward, but um, you should know that there are people out there using other solutions and they are very nicely uh, narrated and uh, and covered in this section 9.2, where you can see, of course, one option is independent analytics, where people do everything on their own, um, and then at some point, uh, converge and share results without a common data model. Um, and then there's also the other versions of uh, 
common protocol with local and individual data extraction and a central analysis. Um, and probably the one you might be familiar with is this study specific common data model where for each individual study you generate a data set. Um, uh, I have had experience with many of these options. I think this last one mentioning 9.2.4 is probably the one that kept me awake for longer um, at some point in my life <laughs> and the one that uh, I still remember when I met uh, Patrick uh, and Peter in 2016 at the EMA when he was still in London uh, in December 2016 and I heard about this you know idea of a general CDM rather than a study specific CDM and I I realized I had been wasting a little bit of time. <laughs> Luckily, I was still quite young and, and managed to catch up uh, in the following years. Um, but yeah, of course, then you have the uh, the approach that you're more familiar with, which is the general CDM with a uh, with a common data model that basically caters for any kind of study you want to do. Loads of um, uh, mentions to ODC, to Darwin EU, to the OMOP CDM, and loads again of um, nice references that you're all familiar with, uh, including uh, the legend study, including the now mythical almost study on the safety or the risk of hydroxychloroquine that we did back in 2020. I guess goosebumps when I remember that time. Uh, and all the work that we've done on background rates and uh, and phenotyping using the Omobsidium. Um, Finally, there is a section on channels, uh, sorry, challenges uh, of the different uh, models and approaches to multi database studies, uh, which I think is very well informed and covers uh, all the different options above. I think I will I will stop there and uh, and allow still some time for questions. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you, Danny, and thank you to all of the uh, presenters for your comments. Uh, we do have ten minutes. I know there's been a number of questions in the chat. I didn't mean to raise my hand. Um, and so possibly we could go back. But at this point, I think let's just focus on um, maybe a, a verbal Q&A. So if anybody has questions, if you could just use the raised hands function um, and we'll kind of get through as many of these as we can. And then in the meantime, if any of the presenters want to go back through the chat and um, and and, you know, maybe see any questions that refer, uh, refer to them you could you can answer them there uh but in the meantime yeah hey craig i realize that not everybody may be able to see the chat so, I, so the first big set of questions christoph you posted um uh, so just read those so they're directed to catherine when you start or, or christoph if you want to ask your question that'd be great oh I, just first comments great resource catherine i, I want to read this as a textbook i, I was curious though how um, what, what the process is for change management of this document? Do you like maintain a repository that tracks changes? And how do you obtain consensus on your recommendations? And, and, and how do you consider new entries? So, so just how is this sort of document managed over time? And, and how do folks participate in it? Yeah, you're on mute, Catherine. Catherine, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, it's 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 a great question, and I wish we had a formal uh, change management process in place. And uh, it's, um, I mean, we are we are obviously recording all the participations, and each chapter is led by a group of authors. Like Daniel just presented the chapter on multi database analysis, and and I know that the authors have been going, you know, back and forth discussing. So there's really some, I would say, empowerment of each group of authors for a given chapter, and the, and then there's this like overarching guidance and discussion at the level of working group one. There's nothing really formal in place, and and like I said a bit in the beginning, we I think we need to revisit probably how we do this because traditionally, you know, every year adding reference, and uh, I don't think there's a very systematic or structured approach that is similar to all chapters. And um, actually, we're probably going to take a pause next year uh, because it's it's a huge work. And uh, there's Juliana Fox who's on the call today, and she's been coordinating all authors, chasing authors. Um, so um, we it's it's definitely something we we want to take into account how we can do even better. But I think Danielle, as a as a hand, maybe wants to to follow up on that. 
Yeah, so I, I would probably say for new chapters, it's probably more of a strategic sort of discussion mm -hmm. internally and then trying to identify relevant sort of authors. I think when it comes for an update, obviously if someone's, there are certain chapters that don't need, maybe are considered not that much of an update, so it's quite light touch. Um, but what if if a proposed update does come through by the uh, authors of the chapters, th those potential updates are screened and reviewed. And if something was considered inappropriate or not correct or anything, there would be an opportunity okay. to sort of feed that back or not accept that suggested change as well. So there's, there is almost a little bit of a two step process um, uh, in that respect. But I think there's always room for for how we might improve things moving forward. So. Thank you. There was a question in the chat from Hong Fang about the uh, issue of unstructured data and then how we're incorporating that in a firm capacity. And certainly in our community, we have a, uh, a work group focused on natural language processing and a lot of the innovations that are coming through there. So I was wondering if anybody would like to comment about well, what's currently in the document there, but also what, what directions you think potentially could be expanded in that specific space. Maybe something for Louis? <laughs> yeah, that, Louis that's, that's, uh, that's a great question. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's so many avenues to take from it. Um, so we, we, we have sort of broadly speaking, we have a knowledge mining sort of initiative at, at the agency that intend that, that the purpose of which is to sort of structure um, unstructured documents, and that could be applicable to all sorts of things. We're currently using it for things that we produce, so um, documents that we generate at the agency ourselves. But but it's applicable across across um, any um, document and data source. Um, there are issues around accessibility to that information, though, because of data protection concerns. So we don't have a lot of unstructured information. Um, so not a lot of opportunity to apply that. Um, so I'm not sure we can provide a lot of guidance in terms of the NLP side of things and how to do um, knowledge extraction and, and so on, um, I, because we just don't have exposure to it. I think Nicholas wants to come in. He's got probably got a lot of experience there. Well, just to add to in, in the guide today, there are some comments around natural language processing, specifically as it relates to the regulatory information and in creating that evidence database from from the SBC, so the SBLs. There, there is some mentioning there when we talk about something that's reporting data set in duplicate text in particular, we refer to some work done by the FDA where they use natural language. But for, from where I contribute, it's a bit patchy. So maybe there is cause to sort of consolidate this because the methods are the same, I think, largely. I mean, the basic methods will be very similar. So maybe it would make sense to have some section dedicated to that, how that applies to, you know, regardless which which data source we're thinking about. Very good. And, and Hayden posed a question about uh, any guidance that that you suggest that we need to have as it relates to processes of data standardization. So like in, in the question in the comment of specifically getting data to the OMOP comment. Management activities that go on in that journey from data to evidence. Is there anything that you think is a gap there that maybe needs to be expanded or do you feel like that's covered? or specifically out of scope? You, I think you are, you are breaking up a, a bit, Patrick, at least for me, but uh, I, I think the scope is the right word here because initially we we are really, you know, thinking how to design uh, a, a robust pharmacopidemiological study, taking into account all necessary elements and all that. So I think it's it's something that would be worth having a discussion about where, where do we set the threshold where it goes too la too largely into data science or um, so it's 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 a it's a, it's a tricky question because it's becoming it's. It's it's becoming really a big, big, big document. So um, yeah, where do we set the the limits? I don't know. I don't have an immediate answer. It looks like Claire has a question. Yeah, kind of piggybacking off of that. Um, I, I'm just curious your you know your thoughts around um, you know there, there's obviously a section on on data quality, which of course I, I'm very happy to see. Uh, but I'm curious your thoughts on um, kind of in the future of pharmacopoeia epidemiology and real world evidence. If you think um, 
evidence of data quality procedures or measures um, will be in, should or will be included um, as part of the um, corpus of, of, of supplemental information, I guess, required from the EMA or, or other regulatory agencies. I think this is a much broader question and uh, I confirm it was Luis or Daniel mentioning the EMA data quality framework, uh, which is going to be published very soon. And obviously a lot of regulators have, uh, you know, have this in mind and uh, there, there will be also discussion in terms of harmonization at ICH level, etc. So I think it's a much, much, much broader question. And, um, and you know, NCEP is not a regulatory document. It's not a regulatory guidance. It's a non-regulatory. So of course it's hosted by EMA was created by EMA at the time at the time of the new uh, pharmacovigilance regulation 2012 etc but it's not a regulatory document it issues recommendations and yeah like I said there's there's so much going on and uh, uh, yeah one first step would be the data quality framework soon thank you I'm gonna take the prerogative to for sure <laughs> I'm gonna take the prerogative to ask one last question maybe provocative question uh, and I'll ask anybody who wants to answer it. So from my vantage point, getting a paper cited in this NSEP guideline is like work le worth like 100 citations of a normal paper because oh. it feel like it can actually like get to somebody who actually should use it. So I'm curious, what is, if, if there's something the Odyssey community could do, what's that next paper you all think needs to be produced that you all will cite in the next NSEP go round if we could produce it? Oh, that's a good question. I had a cheeky an question yeah. answer and and on on the phenotyping, but I think uh, yeah, um, yeah. So I think phenotyping is is the the next bit. And the other thing I would discuss mm -hmm. is we. I'm not sure that there's a model to share results. There is there is the OMOP, but I'm not sure we have sort of a, a model to share results with uh, with people. It's interesting that you mentioned not to mention phenotyping because um, and Patrick, initially you were saying that uh, the, the, the guide is really used by multiple people and multiple initiatives. And I'm in the ICH M14 working group, which is uh, uh, harmonizing guidance about what to put in a in a good pharmacoEP protocol looking at safety studies and uh, no later than this afternoon earlier today we had a discussion about what's the definition of a phenotype so I was going to the <laughs> I was going to the ODC website and um, there's a uh, yeah I, I would agree Louis it's uh, probably a hot topic Daniel do you want to make a final comment before we close Yes, I would say that, you know, as we've progressed in the types of analyses, the, the sort of distributed federated analysis built on HOMOP is really sort of revolutionizing and really, you know, moving forward the area. So whilst you've asked us what the question is, I've got high expectations for you to actually be leading the way in the methodological developments for us to consider. So, you know, keep a, a, a broad set, of, you know, br think think out the box um you know uh keep the conversation open if you see any gaps uh let us know if and likewise if we we see something we may bring something to yourselves as well so and 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 please reach out if you have any more suggestions if you think the the table of content doesn't really make sense we've been reshuffling it a lot so any any suggestion would be really and of course uh new authors um Contribution very welcome always.